Chapter 41, Chapter 41 Fan Fan, Chapters in Advance in Patreon, Patreon.com, Slash Holy Joker, 20 plus chapters in advance, Fitoyik, okay, Chapter 41 Sec, Katara looked at the figure in the mist, and she felt something familiar about it, but as the mist around them cleared out, the man wasn't someone she had ever met before, he has strikingly silver white hair, red eyes, and an emotionless face, the demeanor of the man seemed like that of a warrior, as he wore clothes that were fit for a warrior, and his blue armor showed that he might be from the Northern Water Tribe. The man looked at Aang and Katara. His stare was so fierce that it made them nervous. Did you do this? His simple question was all both of them needed to know that he knew they were the ones who had caused the dam to break. Aang looked down in shame. Yes, he admitted his mistakes. We were fooled by someone who we thought might be our friend. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity, said the man emotionlessly, but it was clear that he was angry. Using waterbending to destroy innocent villages. Learn who is your enemy, don't act out of ignorance without knowing what you are doing. Katara's gaze also fell, knowing that what she had done would have killed hundreds of people if the man hadn't been here to stop it. She had nothing to say and couldn't help but think of her brother's words and what he had said when they told him what they were doing. Do not be stupid. Those were the words he had said. She had preached that they knew what they were doing, but sadly, that isn't it. The man's red eyes were terrifying as he looked at them. But the atmosphere was broken when Soka, breathing heavily, appeared. He looked at Aang and Katara, waving at them. Hey there, are you guys okay? Neither of them answered, too endorsed in the consequences that their reckless actions could have caused. But Sokka glanced at the man with a knowing smile and waved at him too. Hey, Master Tobirama, so you met my sister that I was talking about. Aang was surprised and came out of his stupor. Sokka, you know him? Yeah, he is Tobirama, a master waterbender that agreed to teach you. Yeah, that's not happening, added Tobirama causing Soka to look at him with a cringing face like he had swallowed a whole lemon. But the man was insistent. I am not going to teach people that are irresponsible enough with their bending that they almost killed an entire village full of innocent people. There were even children in there. What if I wasn't around? Sokka winced. Hey, come on, can't you give them another chance? No, the man answered simply and started walking off. A mist surrounded him, which obscured everyone's view, and then he disappeared. Only a puddle was left on the ground. This caused Sokka to sigh. Damn it. One went through so much to have that guy even consider teaching you. Sorry, Ang apologized. But this caused Sokka to shake his head. No, no, there is no need to apologize. Just make sure that you don't do something like this again. Also, tell me when you are doing things like this. When you said you were helping the rebel group, I thought it was just to drive off some Fire Nation soldiers and not fill Adam. Sec. Sokka POV. I could see it in their eyes that both Katara and Aang were sorry and apologetic about what they had done, which was at least a step forward. Also having my water clone transform into Tobirama and then have mist around it while I dispelled it would make him appear more mystifying. This had been all carefully planned to make a picture where Aang and Katara would learn from it. Using Tobirama as my transformation target was to play his character. People instinctively judged what kind of person someone was within the ten seconds of their appearance. So I had to make him imposing and seem like a figure of authority, while at the same time expressing himself as a master waterbender. Quest completed. Defend the village. 10,000. Demonic illusion. Hellview. I looked at the last notification and mentally selected it. Demonic Illusion, Hell Viewing Technique, Level 1. A weak, D-ranked Genjutsu can be used to show their target's worst fears, can easily be broken through, as expected. My gamer interface changed as soon as I made contact with Chakra. Now it was offering Naruto World rewards too, but what made me curious was how Genjutsu worked in this world. It would either be unbreakable by the normal people or less. No one other than me had Chakra in this world. So that made it unbreakable because one needed to use chakra to break through a genjutsu. But at the same time, a genjutsu was something that was attached to a person's chakra network. That was how it was used. 
This was also how sensor ninja-like Karen were able to tell when someone was under an illusion. Still, I will have to test this later and see if Genjutsu was effective to the people of this world. While it was a shame, the latter was probably the most likely scenario here, meaning that Genjutsu was mostly useless in this world, and I wasn't willing to have chakra networks built into others just so Genjutsu could be used on them, because that would mean that they will be able to use Jutsu too. Looking at Katara, I went and put my arm around her, bringing her closer to my chest. Don't worry, little sis, as long as you don't make the same mistake. Things like this can't happen anymore. We will save many people, so don't get discouraged so early. She nodded, mushing her face on my chest as I sighed. This is quite hypocritical of me, but right now, I will be the brother she needs to lean on. A couple of hours later, in the forest outside of the village that had almost been destroyed, I looked at my water clone and wondered if this was the best decision. Well, only the future will tell. The best I could do now was make the decision I thought about carefully. I was leaving Avatar's group, of course, not without precaution, as a water clone would stay with them and I had control of it. Also, Kiwi, Appa, Aang, and Katara were friendly characters I had tagged in my map, which meant that I would always know their general locations. Continuing to stay with them would be the safer choice for me, but not the best one. I needed to experience explosive growth, and I was nowhere near where I had to be power-wise. The story in Avatar is quite rapid, and before I know it, Sozin's Comet will come around. This war must come to an end before that. Trusting a 12-years-old kid like Aang to save me was naive and borderline stupid. Instead, from now on, I had to take things into my own hands. So with that in mind, my water clone smiled like I always would and gave me thumbs up while walking away. With a sigh, I turned around and called onto empty air. Evil lady, I need you for something. The space next to me twisted, and she appeared. Her gray skin was pale as ever, with her hair floating about as if gravity didn't affect her. But what was most impressive about her were the red eyes staring at me calmly. She had calmed down and come to terms with her situation. For a being who had been on the top of the food chain for thousands of years, it's surprising just how fast she had adapted to her new slave-like situation. Tell me where the spirits you are contracted with are? I asked her, staring straight into her eyes. She nodded. Someone as smart as her undoubtedly knew that if she messed around with me or got on my nerves, I would kill her. Having mercy on someone who tried to kill me was something I couldn't afford. The only reason she is alive was because she would keep the other spirits off me. Suddenly, dozens of dark portals opened and she pointed at them. You can choose whichever one you want, but be careful, some of them can be dangerous. Oh, this bitch. Did she just try to trick me? Her eyes widened as she noticed me staring at her. Jobingen, if you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics, here it is the link, heave discord.g slash bqd. Chapter 42, Chapter 42, Negotiation. A.N. Chapters in advance in Patreon, patreon.com slash holyjoker. 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 42, Negotiation Sec. The evil lady looked at me nervously, probably guessing what I had in mind. Who said I am going alone? Fighting such strong spirits could lead me to my death. You know that sabotaging me could lead to your death. Don't test me again. She nodded. I wasn't in any way implication to put you into danger, but simply giving you a choice. Smart. She had already found a loophole in the contract that I hadn't thought of. Well, it wasn't that big of a deal, as something like this couldn't have harmed me, because she would have to not withhold any important information from me. But, maybe she could have said the information just when I was about to jump through, and that would have technically been not withholding information from me. Well, the latter was a clause I had intentionally put in. Knowing that she would find another way to withhold information from me, like deleting her memories. That would also be okay with the GS contract. Anyway, you are coming with. Show me which one of the portals leads to the strongest spirit. My words were neutral and didn't have any emotion in them. She knew what would happen after this was over. By failing right now, she had just pushed her time of death closer. There was no need to get angry over this small trickery. I predicted something like this might happen. Intelligence increased by one, 
for predicting your enemy's carefully thought scheme. This was also one of the reasons I was willing to put up with it. She was an intelligent stat grind, always keeping me on my toes while making me stronger. When freezing the river, I knew that my chai, or as it is represented in my status page as MP, was above what most masters had. Meaning I could control a large amount of water. It would have taken at least three waterbenders to do what I had done to save the village. Seems like your friends flew off, the evil lady said with a confused look on her face. She then looked me in the eyes. What are you? No wonder she was confused, having seen my water clone with them. Maybe I will explain it once you give me something useful, I chuckled and offered her my hand. She then pointed towards one of the portals. That leads to the spirit of endurance, Naaman, the strongest spirit I have been able to trick into a contract until now. What are its powers? Physical invincibility, she said casually. No arrows can pierce his skin, no fire can burn him, no weapon can even scratch him. Also, its strength and speed are quite powerful. Even I would have a hard time protecting myself if he attacked. Looking at her eyes, I saw that she seemed to be hiding something from me. Well, I couldn't read her expression, but going logically, the evil lady still would try to trick me. If you hide something from me, the contract will kill you. Do you want to test it without thinking things through? Damn, for the first time she swore and winced. Finally, her true feelings slipped through. She was annoyed. With a resigned sigh, she added, even its eyes have a layer around it and can't be pierced. Well, that was some critical information. After all, when she worded it by saying that the lion had strong skin, most would attack its eyes, which would be the weak point of any creature. Do you know any weakness it has? Sec, evil lady POV. What a fucking smart bastard. It was hard keeping my expressions straight. How can a human who is so young be able to keep up with me in a battle of minds? It annoyed me to no end. But this scumbag was winning. I had no more tricks to pull. No, I don't know how to beat it. While it won't be able to actively kill me due to the contract I have with it, you are a whole other deal. This time deciding to be careful, I told him everything and didn't try to withhold information. Damn it. I thought that during our first meeting, he would have his guard down and think that I wouldn't try to get out of the se on track so early. Should I have acted more panicked when we met? No, he might be my enemy, but he was smart enough to see through such acts. But Naaman was my only chance to try and kill the brat. I tried all my cards in this meeting and it failed. Now that he knew that even I couldn't beat Naaman in a straight battle, he will most likely refuse to fight him too. Fuck. When was the last time I played like this? Even Vadu wasn't this troublesome. Among spirits, rarely would anyone be able to keep up with me. But this slimy bastard was doing so casually. Okay, we are going to fight the spirit of endurance then. His name was Naaman, right? He said suddenly. Happiness blossomed in my heart. This was the happiest I had felt in a long time. Excitement aspired within me that it was hard to keep a straight face. But somehow I was able to do so and nodded at Sokka. Okay, then I will try and restrain him to the best of my capabilities. Screw that, even I wouldn't be able to restrain Naaman. Because while he might be relatively young spirit, only a dozen hundred years old, Physically, he was almost unmatched by any other spirit. Even though this brat might be smart, he wasn't anything special in the end. His young age and arrogance got the better of him. Yes! This was it. A short-lived human would never have the patience required to handle someone like me. I grasped his hand and we walked through the portal. As the darkness around us twisted and turned, I made sure that Sokka wasn't hurt in any way, even by accident, as that would kill me. How the hell did a brat like this get such a contract? I could still feel the shackles in my soul. After he is dead, I will investigate his life and see what happened. Wait. I can't do that, because the contract he had would still be in effect even after his death. Oh well, I was happy right now as this pest is about to be killed. As we landed on the other side, we entered the spirit world. There were a dozen mountains around us, while we were in the middle of a flat field. A lion about the size of an elephant, he had yellow, gold-like skin, and each strand of his fur seemed like it was made of gold. The lion lay on the ground, sleeping. Sokka looked at his hand and waved it, and then smiled. Does bending work here? Yes, I said. 
we were transported physically here. So it would work. Was Sokka a bender? Well, it didn't matter either way. While observing him, he had been under my watch most of the time. He was lucky, but his luck was just about to run out. Do you want me to try and restrain him? I asked Sokka. While sabotaging him was against the contract rules. If he told me to do it, then it would be okay. He shook his head. No, then he looked at me with a gentle smile on his face that was a little creepy. By the way, you are really smart. Sadly, living for so long has breed arrogance and blinded you in one eye. Heh, brat, keep talking. I want to see you die a brutal death. By the way, after this, you will receive a punishment. That didn't matter, but I still nodded towards him, trying to act as submissive as possible. Yes. Good, at least you understand. He then walked towards the lion, and when he was just outside of its reach, he waved his arms. A surprisingly huge amount of water was drained from the plants around us, and it moved into an arc. Naaman remained sleeping, as someone who couldn't be injured, his instincts had suffered quite a bit. But that wasn't a problem, since no predator would be able to defeat him anyway. Sedeok, A.N., if you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics. Here it is the link, hdiscord.gg flak dick ra. Chapter 43. Chapter 43. Battle with Monsters. Chapters in advance in Patreon. Patreon.com slash holyjoker. 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 43. Battle with Monsters, the evil lady, the spirit of strife, was quite ignorant. Though her outward appearance didn't say anything, I could guess what she was thinking about me. Living long had made her blind in one eye. It was inevitable. After all, being strong for so long had made her underestimate humans instinctively. For so long, they were creatures below her, and she saw them at a certain level. Essentially, she had gotten arrogant enough to underestimate me. Again even after I had just tricked and trapped her to essentially be my servant. She probably thought this would help her get out of the contract after the lion killed me. But she forgot something. Even spirits need to breathe. Most of them, at least. If this didn't work, then I always had the boots equipped so that I could teleport myself away and they had nine uses left. I slowly formed a giant bubble around the lion. At first, even then, he didn't seem worried and slowly opened his eyes. I pulled him up with the water, he tried to kick off the liquid, but it was impossible to do so. Boom! He created a giant splash, almost breaking out of the bubble of water I had surrounded him in. But in the end, I controlled the water and had a lot of MP to keep this up. It would be a battle of how long he could keep his breath, or how long I could hold this. Even then, I wasn't just standing around, as I rhythmically waved my hand. Almost like a dance and waves of water started entering the lion through its nostrils and mouth, invading his body. These spirits had forgotten how they were pushed by humans off their land. Because after the humans learned that they could use bending to bend off and kill spirits, they immediately started building settlements, even with spirits around. I glanced at the evil lady spirit, while the contract would kill her and destroy her soul if she broke the contract. It was better to be careful of her but she wasn't making any moves, just looking on in despair. Wait, did she just bet everything on this working? That was a good strategy as I might have had my guard down during the first meeting. Sadly for her, if I was in her situation, I would have done the same, and that helped me predict what she might do. Be prepared to give me something good, offer something valuable, if you don't want me to kill you after this, I told the evil lady, making sure to smile at her nicely. This would unnerve her. Showing anger would worry her, but not showing any when I am angry would scare her. But smiling when I was angry would terrify her. I wasn't some master manipulator or anything like that, but as Amon who had watched a lot of horror movies and was a failed actor at one time, I knew how to give a good scare. Being angry was normal, even expected. A killer who chased after you was scary, but a killer who smiled at you nicely was downright terrifying. With a twist of my wrist, I froze the water inside the lion spirit's body. Surprisingly, he only looked at me angrily as blood started flowing out of his ears, nose, mouth, and even eyes. Yet he still seemed to be okay. Shit, if he was at a lower level, I would have been able to see his health bar and just how much HP it had cost. Honestly, in my last world, 
I had gotten many ideas on how to kill invincible enemies from movies, anime, books, manga, etc. Rawr! Suddenly a large roar scattered the water ball. Within an instant he was free. For a split second, I almost panicked, but calmly, I used this moment to use water bending to manipulate the water that had turned to ice inside his body. I turned it back to water and used it to get into his vulnerable lungs. At one time, humans used to eat spirits, so they probably had some internal organs too. Though I couldn't see where my water was going, I could feel it moving around the lion's body. Sadly though, the lion's spirit landed on the ground as I wasn't able to gather the water for o, asked enough to stop him. Boom! He kicked off the ground and the air around the spirit seemed to crackle. Damn, I can't see it at all. So within a split second, I opened my map and saw the red dot moving towards me. Tilting my body to the side, I was able to dodge his attack. Fwish! But one of my arms was butt through, and so was half of my chest. Blood spurted out. Over 70% of my HP was lost in a split second, and I was close to death due to the bleeding effect. But I stood my ground. Taking out a roll of bandage, and with one arm, I bandaged myself. In the end, I was left with only 20% of my health, as within a second, another 10% was gone due to the bleeding effect. The monstrous lion charged at me again, I saw it on the map. I used to think that I was quite fast, but those thoughts were now thrown out of the window. I couldn't even compare to this guy. Going by stats, just how high would his agility be? 300? 400? Maybe even higher? No, definitely higher. Click. Still, I was fast enough to click my boots before he hit me again from quite a distance. No, I wasn't using them to run away, instead I will fight using them. Within a split second I was atop the mountains, looking down at the lion who stared at me with red eyes, radiating an intense feeling of power. Fuck, I was scared as hell. But, I had to keep calm. Game it helped dull my fear by calming my mind, but it couldn't turn me into an emotionless robot. Hey, little cat, how about you come up here? I smirked at it arrogantly, even though my arm hadn't regenerated. Wait, would it even regenerate? Well, it was no use worrying about it now. What had happened couldn't be changed. Also, this lion spirit needed to keep being angry at me, because if it calmed down, it might be able to think rationally, and that would become an even worse situation. I was close to death, in comparison. Losing an arm was nothing. I will worry in the future about getting my arm back, right now. There are more important things to worry about. Taking out my spear, I held it in one hand, and spear mastery took effect. As long as I held a spear, I would have a boost in stats. Normally holding a spear would impede my waterbending, but I just got a new idea. I bit into my spear handle, still technically holding the thing. So while it might look ridiculous, now I could have the boost in stats while using waterbending. One-handed waterbending was harder, but I got used to it and instantly froze the water in the lion's lungs. Just looked at the lion, and outwardly it seemed like nothing strange happened. By the way, how the hell was it able to roar while in a bubble of water? Was that roar done just by using the little amount of air it had in its lungs while he was sleeping? Well, it seems like that roar was something I will have to look out for too. Also, was this waterboarding I was inside his body even doing anything? Fwish! Once again, the lion charged, but this time the ground below it crackled. With each step it took, it became faster as marks of its claws were left on the ground. Let's see who amongst us will win. You damn overpowered lion with a cheat-like body. It sounded kind of ironic for me to talk about cheat abilities. Said I okay, A.N.? If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character picks, here it is the link. Disc clash, Discord disc clash, it's not tarver. Chapter 44, Chapter 44, A.N., Chapters in Advance in Patreon, patreon.com slash holyjoker, 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 44 Sec Naaman Lion, a spirit who stood at the peak of power physically. His skin was so tough that it said that he was never injured. This kind of monster could take on armies, after all. It wasn't like any weapon or attack could injure it. Such a monstrous creature charged at me. I would be lying to myself if I said that fear wasn't crawling in my heart. But being afraid wasn't a bad thing. It would help me not become overconfident. So with a scared but calm mind, I turned the water inside his body into ice. But once again, the monstrous beast only stumbled for a bit, but didn't stop his leaps. What a damn monster. 
I drew all of the moisture from the plants around me, turning the luscious green mountain into a barren, dark land of death. Water encircled me into a rotating ring, and it was a little hard, but with the increase in agility due to holding the spear with my teeth, Zoro style, I was able to move faster, and the area around me was turned into hard, slippery ice. Since I was atop a steep mountain, the Nam and Lion would have to try and climb ice on a downward surface. Crack! As his feet landed on the ice, he broke through as his claws sang on the hardened water. But even with all of the power behind it, the lion started slipping, unable to get a good footing. This was the advantage of having terrain superiority. Being in an icy land with water all around me, now the Naman lion was in my zone. The creature took a deep breath, and I immediately hit the chai points in my ears. The pain was horrendous, and a ringing sound rang out. Blood came out of my ears, but Jay at least couldn't hear anything temporarily as the ice around the lion broke apart. He had just roared, and that's what I had been on the lookout for. That dangerous roar would have probably paralyzed my body or done something like that, because its power was outrageous. While I still took some damage from it, this was nothing, as at the same time I also used my water bending to attack his lungs, which were vulnerable during the roar. Truly, I was still suspicious of how much damage the lion had taken. Were my attacks even doing anything? It felt like that beast was some invincible monster, but those thoughts of mine were settled down once I saw the lion's legs trembling. I breathed an internal sigh of relief because due to my HP being so low, I planned on retreating, but it seemed like staying a little longer here would be more beneficial. Still, the situation wasn't in my favor yet. So as soon as I see something dangerous, I will have to run. Or else this place could turn into my graveyard. Lifting my hand, the water around me rose, following my commands. Within a split second, it encircled the lion spirit, and it kept rotating around him. Naaman opened his jaw as if to say something, but no sound came out. His lungs have been frozen over and over again. It's honestly baffling just how the hell was this thing still alive. It essentially hadn't been breathing the whole battle. Now, it was just a waiting game. My bleeding effect has stopped, and I had over 18% of my HP left. Suddenly, my ears cleared up as the blocking I had done on them cleared out. The elephant-sized lion growled at me and took another step, and that was when I got an idea. I took the spear back into my hand. Arabenders use their staffs to help with their bending. With a wave of my spear, water attached to the spear's tip, and moved about in a giant whip-like manner. The water moved about easier than water bending with one hand. So I picked up the lion once again and started drowning him. This was the difference between us. I knew how to fight against someone stronger than me. If he got close to me, this lion could kill me in one hit, even do so with relative ease. But now that I had turned the terrain into my advantage, slowly but surely, this monster would fall. Eris, I called out to the evil lady, bringing her out of her stupor. He must be worried about a lot of things. But I didn't care right now. This was the second time she has tried to get me killed. Restrain the lion. She nodded, her eyes turned calm, as always. It seemed like she finally got a hang of her emotions. But by now, I could easily guess what she was thinking. It wasn't that hard to do so anymore. Dark hair extended and while it seemed like normally the evil lady might not be able to restrain the lion normally. Now, the situation has changed. Her hair extended and seemed to grow like metallic wire as it wrapped around the lion. Like thick rope made of steel, the hair wrapped around the lion, clutching its libs tight. Sec, evil lady POV. Fuck, 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 what the hell is up with this situation? He lost half of his upper torso and arm, yet he is still alive. This is madness. Just tying up some bandages stopped his bleeding too. Have I gone crazy? Am I under an illusion? How? This isn't normal. It's beyond logic and understanding. I had made the grave mistake of assuming that Sokka was human. But that wasn't the truth. No matter how looked at it, he wasn't a human. Even calling him a spirit would be an understatement. Maybe he is one of the beings like Old Iron, Vatu, Rava, and the Mother of Faces. Did he hide and disguise himself as a human? Why would he do so? Maybe for entertainment? He was playing with me all along. He was no simple human, to begin with. No, I was the one who didn't notice sooner and acted arrogantly. 
since, when he crushed me in a battle of minds, almost destroyed my conscience when I tried to read his mind. Then he also had that contract that bound my soul, which seemed to be almost otherworldly. I had never seen such a thing before. Now I could see it. Someone like Soka, if that even was his name. He isn't someone I can mess with. The tug in my hair broke me from my thoughts. It felt like my hair would be pulled out of its roots. Though the name and lion might be weakened, as Soka had dealt devastating damage to it. But the spirit was still physically powerful. It felt like it would rip off my scalp. That was when I noticed Soka getting into position, and Naaman opened its mouth, preparing another one of his deadly roars. But Soka, seeming to have already predicted this through his spear, which was powered by his water bending, as a stream of water seemed to propel it into Naaman's mouth. Slick. While the lion's skin was impenetrable, Soka had weakened it enough to kill. The lion slumped on the ground, and I couldn't help but feel a trace of fear grasp onto my heart as Soka's cold eyes landed on mine. He walked towards me, one-armed, but there wasn't even a trace of pain on his face. Neither did his body move strangely or limped due to the lost appendages. As expected, just how long did a spirit need to live to consider such things as pain? Unimportant. Putting his hand in his pocket, he took out a big baked fish. By now, this wasn't even the strangest thing he had done. The fish was too big for something to fit in his pocket. Did he have some kind of spatial manipulation ability like me? He took big bites out of the fish, his eyes still kept staring into mine, in a creepily calm manner. Crushing even its bones with his teeth as he kept looking at me. Such a strange scenario, a one-armed man eating fish while walking toward you. It sounded like a joke with a punchline. But this was reality, and I wasn't laughing. He stopped in front of me, we were close and I could smell the aroma of the cooked fish. The small heat it radiated made it seem like it was just freshly cooked. Can you guess what I am thinking right now? Asked Sokka, munching down on his food, the fish's bones being crushed by his teeth. Answering him right now might get me killed, so instead I kept my mouth shut. This guy was dangerous, and I didn't want to try and play around with him in any way. Wish I had realized this sooner, though. Tam wondering if I should kill you or not, he said casually, as if talking about the weather. I have half a mind to do so, but luckily for you, my mood is fantastic. What, he is in a good mood? But, he almost died? Soka turned around and went towards the lion, only now did I notice something. His arm had regenerated? Think of something you can give me, it could be an item too, but better think fast because I might just decide to kill you. Sokka said, casually walking away. Shit, what can I even offer a guy like that? Many thoughts came to mind, and I didn't plan to hold back on my offers, because my life depended on it. Since he seemed to be so strong, someone like me probably doesn't even qualify in his eyes. So, as Sokka walked towards the Naman lion, he turned on the notifications that he had muted during the battle. Such things would only distract him in a fight, but now he had a chance to check it. You predicted the Naaman lion's roar. Intelligence increased by one. Due to outplaying your enemy, wisdom increased by one. You learned an original way to use waterbending. Wisdom increased by one. He skipped many notifications and just got the summary if there were many of them, especially amongst the level-up notifications. The first thing that had changed was his stats. Name, Sokka. Title. Class, The Gamer, 30, 43, HP, 28, 50, 3500. MP 900, 1225, STR 27, 45, 25, in 32, 33, Wiz 26, 28, Luck 186, Poro 65. He then checked the skills, the ones that had changed. Waterbending, level 10, 16, level 41, 45. Sokka smiled, the improvements weren't small and I had many new things to contemplate, especially the new option he had gotten after level 40, Sokka POV. I decided to look into the gamer interface later, and instead walked back to the evil lady. By now my arm had healed, sadly my clothes hadn't. Gamer's body was a weird skill. After all, game characters don't lose their clothes just because they got hit by an attack or injured. Still, it seemed like it could only fix clothes up to a small degree. Also as expected, as soon as my HP filled up, my arm regenerated. What a monstrous ability, it made me seem inhuman. This is all I can offer you.
please spare me. The evil lady bowed down, her head touching the ground as she showed me a book. It didn't have any title on it, so I used Observe. Book of One Thousand Spirits. It has knowledge of a vast number of spirits. Their strengths, weaknesses, powers, etc. are all recorded in it. She also offered me many other items and trinkets that were useful, which I just shoved all of them in my inventory after making sure that they weren't cursed. Those were some good items, I complimented her. Then, picking up my spear, with an elegant sweep, I cut off her head. The contract didn't let her resist in any way when I attacked her. With a swipe of my hand, the water rose and froze her body and head. Then I cut both of them into thousands of little pieces, making sure that she wouldn't resurrect or something like that, because I still haven't gotten a notification of her death. You have killed Eris. So she was at a higher level than the Naaman Lion. That's a little surprising, since she was much weaker than him in fighting capabilities. Sorry, Eris, but I can't seem to be able to afford you, I said and clicked my boots and teleported away. Try to kill me once that's on you, and I might let you live for a while, because of the benefits. Betray me after that, and I will kill you, no matter what. Still, I got quite a lot from her. The new items are also very nice, though, no matter what she gave me, I wasn't going to spare her in the end. JSS Soyo CO IOS. This chapter is much longer than usual, because I didn't want to leave it in a bad cliffhanger. P.S. Sokka planned to kill her all along, since she was the one who started it, but first, he was going to use her to the bone before doing so. If his actions sometimes seem contradictory to his usual personality, he obviously didn't change in a split second, and is doing the action for a reason. P.P.S. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character picks, here it is the link, discord.jiza.ra. Chapter 45. Chapter 45. A.N. Chapters in advance in Patreon. Patreon.com slash holyjoker. 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 45 sec. I was teleported back to the beautiful and lush forest from where I had been before the evil lady took me to the spirit world. The trees were high and could probably hide quite a lot on top of them. Laying down on the soft grass, I took a deep breath and started meditating. This was to organize my thoughts and contemplate some things. Also, I knew that meditation was the key to entering the spirit world without having to rely on other outside forces. Initially, I had thought that the Avatar was one of the only strongest creatures around. Though I had learned otherwise, and my latest opponent proved that this world wasn't as weak as I had initially thought it would be. Spirits like Old Iron, a giant samurai-like spirit that even Avatar Yangchen had difficulty beating in her Avatar state. Vatu and Rava were at the top, but their powers weren't quite consistent, and neither of them stayed strong for long, in comparison to the time other spirits spent in their peak power. It was safe to assume that there were other spirits out there, like the Nami and Lion, those that had abilities to destroy armies. Such a thought was a little scary but exciting at the same time. Fighting humans wasn't worth it, but killing spirits could mass level up me quickly. If people knew what I did, most would think that I also could destroy armies because I was able to defeat the Naaman Lion. But that wasn't the case at all. Just because I defeated him, it doesn't in any way correlate that I could defeat armies. I didn't have invulnerable skin or anything like it. Even if one soldier was able to do only 10 damage on average, with numbers that would add up into a painful death. Still, even then, soldiers could do more than 10 HP of damage, especially in bigger numbers as it would get harder to dodge the attacks. Still, even such an ability would be useless for me. If I went and just solved things with brute force, it would be stupid. Sure, I could go and do that, but then I would have to kill myself off to return everything to balance. Humans wouldn't come to accept having an overlord of power amongst them. There is the Avatar, but he at least is in a cycle that resembles humans and can die off. But the Avatar also will never become a king or any kind of leader. Only people with short foresight would do something like use power to solve such complicated problems. In the end, no amount of luck would be able to save me from stupid mistakes. For understanding the gist of the world and how human minds work, wisdom increased by one. Damn. 
If I had the time, I could grind the intelligence and wisdom stats so easily. Some people found it more fun to work out and exercise, but for me, reading was easier. So essentially, increasing intelligence and wisdom would be easier. Why would I waste my stat points when my favorite hobby was reading? The multidimensional chat was proof that other worlds existed, even though currently traveling to them was essentially impossible. That was something I will have to try and figure out after ending this war and helping the Southern Water Tribe develop into something that the Northern Water Tribe would essentially take over later in the story. But now, I won't let that happen. I still remember from Korra, the Southern Water Tribe is essentially something the Northern Water Tribe controls. With a sigh, I opened my eyes and looked at my stats. I was tempted to try and put some stats into intelligence or wisdom, but that would be foolish. Those stats were a breeze to increase for someone like me, who liked to read. So with that in mind, I put them all in the one stat I had been unable to increase naturally despite many tests. Luck 186. 326. Chance hit. No matter how improbable, when you attack. Once every 10 days, you have the chance of 100% hitting your target, once, by an attack. No matter how fast they are, or whether they try to dodge the attack. Worth evaluation. Level max. It is said that every living being is the same and has the same worth. One can't see that. Well, you can now. Can only be used once every 24 hours. Oh, these skills, while they sounded simple, this was something that would help very much, because even in the later stages when I became stronger, chase hit was something that could be a trump card. At the same time, worth evaluation was like having information and seeing if someone was worth investing in without having to learn from failure. It got rid of the failure part. This would be essentially very crucial when I decided to build up the Northern Water Tribe. Still, while dangerous, Looking back at it, maybe sparing the evil lady's life the first time was the best decision I could have made. Because I wanted to kill her back then, too, and never forgot what she had done. Still, sparing her momentarily had wielded some good benefits. Getting up, I dusted myself off and pulled out a spare pair of clothes from my inventory. They were green clothes that belonged to the Earth Kingdom citizens. I had prepared myself for this for quite a while, and since my inventory space was quite big, it was essential to use it to hold on to things like these. I went towards one of the rivers and pulled up a blank mask that covered my face. From now on, it was crucial to make sure that people didn't associate me with being in two places at the same time. Also, I will have to think of excuses just in case I am found out, as it is better to prepare an excuse than come out with one immediately. Walking through the forest, it was quiet and the sound of animals chipping about. It was so peaceful and nice. After such an intense battle, where even a slip of concentration could be fatal, this was something I was welcoming. Now that Aang, Katara, and my water clone were on their adventures, I had to do my part and gather an army. I wasn't going to wait until Sozin's comet to come around, because that would be very bad. It would essentially be my loss by then. Because while I was a lucky guy, my companions didn't share my luck, so I couldn't bet on Aang having the same encounter as he did originally. Plus, by now, things had changed quite a bit that I doubted things would go the same. Also, after getting past level 40, I had unlocked the Minecraft crafting table, though it seemed to be more like an anvil as it could combine weapons and items. Level 50 allowed me to see the relationship levels. Qatar had 100-100, so that was cool. Knowing that even after all our bickering, she cared about her dear older brother. The rest were mostly what I had predicted them to be around, except Zabuza. He was at two hundreds. While he hadn't gone into negative numbers, by now I had thought that the man at least trusted me somewhat. It seems like once a ninja will always be a ninja. He was as untrustworthy as a shark, so it seemed like any kind of friendly or true working relationship we might develop in the future, it will have to be one based on benefits. I must keep myself two steps ahead of him and get the most jutsu from the man. Damn. He was a hard man to manipulate. Sec. In another world, where ninjas were all around the planet, Zabuza stood at one of the tables, Haku behind him, with a woman with red spiky and long hair. By her side stood a middle-aged man with an eye patch. 
the meeting had a tense feeling to it. Haku, who was by the sidelines, felt her heart jump in fear of what might happen. So you went and killed off one of the richest people in the world and took his money? May questioned him coldly. This wasn't something she had told him to do. Not one of the richest people, but the richest person. Zabuza smiled, though the smile under his bandages couldn't be seen. But he was still holding his ground in the conversation. He had brought a huge sum of money back that would be able to be used by the resistance. To him, that was more than enough to help to help them. Also, Gato would have paid Zabuza that much, even if he did 100 missions. But still, May was worried about the repur, cushions of this. After all, if they take over the hidden mist, then they will be known as the kind of ninjas who kill their clients. Who would want to work with that? Clients would just go to other villages. Also, most of Gato's wealth was held in stocks or his own companies which he had invested in. Being rich didn't necessarily mean having all of that money on hand. Zabuza, while he seemed proud as he had taken matters into his hands, May was skeptical of something. Is he being manipulated? While someone like Zabuza was not well educated on what killing Gato would do, he acted too impulsive, contemplated May. The people who paid for ninjas weren't always good. They usually wanted a problem to disappear. It was a common thing to have assassination targets, kidnappings, and many other shady things as ninja missions. But if word got out of what Zabuza had done, then even if they took over, it would economically cripple Hidden Mist Village. May wanted to yell at the man in front of her and bash his head in, but decided not to do so. Ninjas dealt with their problems in the dark. Not so openly. TC, May smiled at him sweetly and nodded. Thank you for everything, Zabuza. This will be a big help. He nodded. Getting up, catching on that he was being quietly dismissed. No problem. As he got out of the tent, May's eyes turned icy cold. You know what to do. We can't take back our village with someone like that in our midst. Also, erase all information that he was associated with us. Zabuza had been someone loyal to the resistance and even tried to kill the Mizukage by himself in the past, endangering his life. Sex still, as Zabuza walked out, he looked around and saw other ninjas in the resistance looking at him. Their faces had become hard and cold due to the civil war. He could sense that something was wrong here. So he put a hand on Haku's shoulder and whispered, We need to get out of here. Though he might not understand the geopolitical situation of a country or how the economy worked in great detail, the demon of the hidden mist knew one thing, and that was when people wanted to kill him. Hmm, why did something happen? inquired Haku, even though he too was already next to Zabuza as they escaped. But Zabuza knew just how strong Mei was, Haku wouldn't be able to hold her back as Boil and Lava Style heavily countered the Yuki bloodline ability. So in the end, he made his decision, taking out two scrolls and handing them over to his disciple. Take them. One of them will allow you to communicate with certain people, and the other has information on the people and how to use the strange scroll. Don't worry, I will be right behind you. Though he said those words full of conviction so much that even Haku believed them, ninjas were the best liars. Zabuza planned on dying today, and he knew that if he didn't give Mei too much trouble, she hopefully wouldn't chase after Haku, who was uninvolved in these matters. As his student, Haku once again followed her teacher's words. But not even ten seconds after she walked away, like the silent breeze in a forest, dozens of ninjas wearing masks with the hidden mist insignia on them appeared. Sah! Can't you guys just fake my death or something? Zabuza asked, fearlessly taking out his giant sword. Fwish! May appeared in front of him. She had a gentle smile on her face. Sorry, but this is the best I can do for you. Don't worry, I will let that student that you love so much go free. Ch, don't talk about love, you bitch, he swore at her. Annoyed that she was talking about things like love, while at the same time making it clear that she will kill him. It's goddamn annoying. No matter which side I am on, I always end up getting tossed aside then it's about time I make my side. Zabuza swung his giant sword towards Mei, who didn't even bother to dodge, as, within a second, the Anbu surrounded him and had stabbed their short swords into his body. The battle was a no contest to who would win. He was in their main base. Zabuza didn't bother to resist her, 
as while May's words sounded like she wouldn't do anything to Haku. If he gave her trouble, she would hunt down Haku like a mad dog. This was a clear, unspoken threat. Sorry, Zabuza, May apologized. If the world was a little kinder, it would allow people like us to. Shut the hell up, you bitch. Zabuza coughed out blood as he warily fell to the ground. I don't want the last thing I hear to be your annoying voice. May nodded. She hadn't wanted to kill him either, but this was the life of a ninja, one where even a single mistake would lead to their death. Fedoia Kais Some people might wonder why Zabuza wasn't so active in the dimensional chat, but each of the members has their own goals and lives, just like Soka does. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics, here it is the link, slash discord.jigi delesh bikithik aa. Chapter 46 Chapter 46 A.N. Chapters in advance in Patreon, patreon.com slash holyjoker, 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 46 Sek Ang, Soka, and Katara were atop Appa, flying towards their destination. It had been a few days since the last time the water clone of Soka that was here with them was made. During the Great Divide, when they passed through the canyon with the help of an earthbender, they were also accompanied by two rival clans that Ang helped make peace with. Not long after that, they had been caught in a storm and had to settle down. Sokka's clone kept glancing at Katara. Cough! Maybe we should go and find you a doctor, suggested the clone. Don't worry, Sokka, it's just a common cold, she said with a smile on her face. He nodded and then looked at Aang. How long do you think we will be staying here for? Ang shrugged. Maybe a day or two, until Appa rests up. To get us out of that storm, he tired himself out. Okay then, I will be outside, exploring the surroundings. The water clone got up and walked outside. Aang had an excited look on his face and was about to ask if he could come along. But Sokka's water clone shut him off. Also, please look after Katara, she seems a little sick. Told you I am okay. Katara pouted, but Sokka's water clone didn't take her words into account. After walking into the forest, it looked around suspiciously. Unlike the original, he didn't have any of the gamer interface functions. Even the skills he inherited from the original were barely one-tenth as good, maybe even weaker. Still, though, he had sense danger, and could sense it around 0.01 cents before it happened. Which wasn't useful, but today the water clone had another goal. He wasn't here to explore, as he said, but to dispel himself. Unable to send messages to the original, this was the only way he could notify Sokka that something was wrong. But something unexpected happened. Fwish, fwish, fwish! Arrows flew towards him with pinpoint precision, nailing him to a tree before he could react or do anything. The cone looked at the arrows and saw that they had only hit his clothes. Yuyan archers, the clone whispered before he slammed the back of his head into the tree, dispelling himself and turning back to water. That freaked out the other archers when they saw it, but they were soldiers trained into being calm and collected. They were the best archers in the world, so if there was something they didn't understand, it was best to report it to the higher-ups. They rushed back to their heavily guarded stronghold and saw a figure atop the wall. The archers immediately bowed. Princess Azula, we have some strange news to report to you. Oh? The young princess looked at the archers, intrigued. She was someone who is considered a prodigy for her age, and pretty enough that in the future, any husband would be happy to have her. The archers who had come back seemed almost afraid as if they had seen a ghost. Only their strict training was keeping them from screaming out in fear. Then get on with it. I don't have all the time in the day. We saw one of Avatar's comrades close by and tried to capture him. But we failed. The leader of the Yuyan Archer's squad that was outside for tracking spoke with a shaky voice. The memory of Soka turning into water still haunted him. The Fire Nation hadn't fought waterbenders in quite a while, but everyone knew that bending didn't mean one could turn their body into water. As suspected, the Avatar is close by. But he knew that he would sound crazy if he said out loud what they saw but he also understood that Princess Azula wasn't someone forgiving. Sokka, one of the Avatar's companions, turned himself into water. Okay, so he is an illusionist? Questioned Azula, and that was when the men came to a realization. While they had assumed immediately their enemy had a special ability that only a spirit would have, 
the princess had a more logical explanation to what they had seen. Still, running away from your enemy is treason, so spend a couple of months in care. Jail, maybe then you will understand that running away wasn't an option. Please, princess, forgive us. We only did what the commander wanted us to do. Please. But Azula walked off, not hearing any more of their excuses. What they were worried about wasn't going to prison, but being fired, because if a Fire Nation soldier is imprisoned, it's the same as saying that he was fired. The Yuyan archers had trained their whole lives in the art of the bow, so they didn't know any other way of life except how to be a soldier. Colonel Shinu, a tall man, with mutton chops for a mustache, and he had on the traditional firebender uniform, but without the helmet. This person had initially been in charge of the fortress until Azula came. Princess, firing Yuyan archers will come at a great cost, the man tried to persuade her. Training the archers takes a lot of time, and each of them is worth twenty men in any battlefield. Azula frowned and stopped walking, turning around and looking the colonel straight in his eyes. Are you questioning my decision? No, princess, I am simply informing you that Yuyan archers are hard to train, he swallowed nervously. Having seen what Azula was capable of, he didn't want to find himself on the opposing side of her wrath. She then turned around and kept walking. You would have to be stupid to let those men anywhere near close a battlefield. Wad, didn't you see their eyes? They were scared of something unnatural. Yes, that must have been quite an illusionist. Are you brain dead? Azula questioned him. If an illusionist was so good, then he would be famous around the world. It's probably some kind of spirit. Then, wouldn't that make it even more dangerous? No, spirits have been pushed off this world by humans. There is no reason to be afraid of them illogically, the young princess stated fearlessly. Anna, also the next time you ask a question, you will be court-martialed. Yai, yes, princess. So, at the same time, in a forest far away, something was moving through the trees like a shadow. Fwish! Sokka, who had just gotten the notification that his clone had been dispelled, was rushing towards where Aang and Katara were. He had pinged them in his map since they were friendly, he could do so. But unlike shadow clones, water clones don't send back memories, and that worries Sokka. Because in his mind, the worst kind of scenarios were playing. With the help of Skypeer Spear, his running speed was almost as fast as a cheetah's top speed. These last days, he had been training himself, leveling up skills like chi blocking and Kyoshi-style martial arts, which have increased his agility quite a bit. Officially, his agility passed over 50, so he had earned a new skill. Bullet time, level max, can be used only once a day, and for 10 minutes it increases the user's running speed by 300%. He contemplated using it, but in the end, there was no other choice. Bullet time. The world around him became darker and blurry, as his running speed increased past what he could keep up with. At first, he was almost about to smash into a tree, but luckily he was able to dodge it in combination with his Senger skill. So, relying on his luck and sense danger, Sokka decided to use bullet time to its full limits and he moved at speeds impossible for the human body. S-R-A-A-A-A-O-R, A-O-R. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics, here it is the link, discord.gg slash B-Q-R-A. Chapter 47, Chapter 47, Lions and Lambs, and chapters in advance in Patreon, patreon.com slash holyjoker, 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 47, Lions and Lambs, Sec, in a dark swampy land, trees and wetness, a dark cave stood, which had its entrance covered by vines. From the outside, the cave seemed almost sinister. Within it was Appa, who was laying down, sleeping after a long journey, and Katara's condition continued getting worse, with her fever heightening. She was barely able to move her body. But even through all of this, what worried her more was Sokka's disappearance. Her brother hadn't been back ever since he went out, and she worried that something might have happened to him. Aang had also gone to look for him and find Katara some medicine. He hadn't been back either. Kiwi, the little fox, was the only one here able to take care of Katara by bringing her water or whatever she asked. The fox was scared because since she was so young, she couldn't use her ability to transform back into her giant form very often. It would take months before she could do so again. But the little furry creature knew that Sokka wouldn't care about any of that. 
If Katara was hurt, Kiwi felt like this might be her last day of life. She didn't know what was going on with Sokka, but the little spirit doubted the enemies were able to kill the slippery guy. He knew when to retreat in case of a dangerous situation. At the same time, Aang, who was outside, flying with his glider, kept looking around and looking for any sign of civilization, but he wasn't having much luck. Only dark, wet swamps greeted his sight, and it seemed to go on forever. He had a worried look on his face as it felt like everything was going wrong. With Sokka disappearing, then Katara got sick, and now he was unable to even see any life of human settlements around. How could things even get any worse? Fwish! An arrow suddenly flew towards him, with a precise, straight-line trajectory. Aang tried to dodge, and he was barely able to fly out of the arrow's way, and got a small cut on his cheek while doing so. That was fast, he muttered, never having seen an arrow so fast, but now he was on guard and felt confident. Fwish! Fwish! Twenty other arrows came. Aang was able to not have any of the arrows hit him, but only barely so. Suddenly, he started plummeting, and looking up, he noticed that a couple of flaming arrows had hit his glider. When did the arrows land? He was confused, but couldn't do anything but be ready for a fight. Yet, Aang was confused by where his enemies even were, as he hadn't caught clear sight of them yet. He glanced at his glider, regretfully. That was the last relic he had that the monks had made for him. Without having much time to think about it anymore, Aang used a soft stream of air to stop himself from slamming to the ground. That caused some water to rise. Fwish! 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 Hundreds of arrows bombarded him. Each of them was outside of his vision, their view blocked by the droplets of water that had risen. These archers were experts, the best Aang had ever seen. He was barely able to swing his arm to create a wall of ice in front of him. It stopped some of the arrows, but one arrow hit at its weak place causing some cracks, and another arrow hit the already stuck arrow, snapping the other arrow in half. This forced the cracks in the ice wall to get larger, breaking the ice wall. Aang jumped back, but noticed that there was a tree behind him, which was good for the time, as it would at least protect his back. He tried to use the swampy waters around, but three arrows hit his arm, one piercing straight through his palm, making him wince as blood dripped from his hand. Due to the pain, he lost contraction and his water bending was interrupted. Ah! Aang screamed out in pain, as a dozen other arrows came at him and hit his clothes, nailing him towards a tree. Normally, without his hands and legs, Aang might have been vulnerable, but Sokka had taught him that bending can be done with all parts of the body, that inculcated head, fingers, chest, and even tongue. Buffle! But suddenly, a strange smell came into his nose. He noticed that a gas bomb was thrown in front of him, and he slowly passed out. No. Katata. Those were the last words he muttered as unconscious darkness claimed him. From behind one of the swamp trees, Azula walked from behind it, and she had a pleased smile on her face. The Yuyen archers are truly remarkable. I didn't have to even get involved. The said archers came from their hiding places, which included behind the trees, atop trees, and some were hidden in the swampy waters, covered in mud. It's all due to your plan, Princess Azula, that things went so smoothly. Yes, the knockout gas was a genius idea. Azula smiled. These archers had impressed her too. She had never thought that they would be this good at following her plans. Yes, now prove your skills to me once again by finding the man called Soka and the other female companion that the Avatar is with. We wouldn't want one of them to come and free him. The next time Aang opened his eyes, he was chained in a metallic coffin with only his head out, and he was mid-air, held up by dozens of chains. There was no water in sight, so even if he could bend with his head, airbending wasn't enough to break metal. Still, Aang was more worried about Katara. She had been left alone and sick, she wouldn't be able to fight against anyone. He guessed that Sokka also was captured by the archers. A despairing feeling filled his heart. He winced as he tried to clench his hand inside the metallic coffin, but it was the one an arrow had pierced during his capture. The situation has become worse. There was no one out there to help them now. 4K, in the swampy regions of the outside. Two archers that were out scouting had caught sight of the cave and noticed that there were some footprints outside of it. They had been swiped by some leaves to cover them, 
but the archers had been professionally trained to track their prey. They smiled. Today was their lucky day. Princess Azula will reward them handsomely for their work. Fwoosh! Suddenly they heard the sound of wind being cut so fast that it made crackling sounds, like a whip. Turning around, they immediately felt like they were flying like ragdolls and saw two headless bodies in the ground. Wait, those were their bodies. Just like that, their consciousness slipped. Sokka POV, I cut the two unsuspecting soldiers that were outside of the cave. Katara was in. Right now, I wasn't in the mood for mercy. But putting the bodies in the inventory was the best way to get rid of any evidence. I didn't want my cute little sister to be traumatized by them. We were better than the Fire Nation and didn't go around killing people. Of course, that's what she needed to continue and believe. Because sadly, wars couldn't be won by soft people. Sometimes you have to be a lion to be the lamb you really are. If you want peace, then use your power and make it a peaceful place. Talking things out never worked in any war. You have to crush your opponents to make them listen to what you have to say. I went towards the cave and saw Katara leaning on Appa. Also, Kiwi was standing in front of my sister. The little fox was shaking in fear and her eyes were closed. She opened her mouth and shot out a fume of smoke. <laughs> then she started coughing. What a pathetic display of fire. But she wasn't even a month old, so I could see why she was so weak. Crouching down, I petted the cute little fox and smiled at her. You did a good job, Kiwi. Sometimes I might be harsh on her, but that's just so she will be kept in line and know our positions weren't those of equals. Katara dotted and spoiled enough for both of us anyway. Speaking of Katar, I walked towards my little sister and saw her looking at me with a tired smile that crushed my heart. Sokka? Am I hallucinating again? You think your mind can hallucinate this handsome face? I took a frozen frog out of my inventory and stuffed it in her mouth. Frog of a swamp. Its skin has very good healing medicine, though it's only released when they are frozen. Due to the map and observation skill, it was easy to find a frozen frog. I still remembered from the show that she needed this to be healed from the cold. The medicine worked like a charm, as Katara quickly got up and spit out the frog that had now come back to life. She looked at me for a little bit before sighing. We have to go and find Aang. He hasn't been here for a while either. Your relationship with Katara increased. Due to the relationship already being at max, you haven't gained any relationship points with Kara. What a silly girl. She was worried about me needlessly. Opening the map, I saw that Aang was in the nearby fortress. He had been captured, but by whom? Zhao was the one supposed to be in charge, but the man is already dead. Well, one am about to find out soon. Can't have the Avatar be treated so roughly. Sarah Triple A-O-R, okay. Okay, Azula is a strategic genius. It was especially shown during her takeover of Ba Sing Se, though she later went crazy and lost that brilliance about her. P.S. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character picks, here it is the link. Chapter 48 Chapter 48 A.N. Chapters in Advance in Patreon Patreon.com slash HolyJoker 20 plus chapters in advance Chapter 48 With Katara by my side, we started searching for Aang while in reality, I was guiding her towards the fortress. Along the swampy mud which Katara froze so we could walk on it freely, I saw a small piece of his glider and showed it to her. It smells like it was burned a little, she frowned. Fire Nation? Probably. Normally I would joke and sarcastically say, you think so? Because it was obviously from the Fire Nation. But I kept these words to myself, knowing that Katara was worried and I didn't want her to feel even worse. Still, judging by the footsteps in the swamps, there were bound to be some scouts around here. If they get close, I would notice in my map and try to walk around them. Still, none had seen us. When I fight with normal humans, I don't plan to use bending. Essentially, a spear is better anyway, since spear mastery can deal with humans easily. The only reason I used water bending most of the time was to fight gigantic creatures or those that I needed to keep my distance from. One day, Katara will come to learn about my bending, probably. But that won't be any time soon. She was already insecure enough about herself, adding that one would make it even worse. Also, I didn't want our enemies to know my abilities. This was the main reason, 
but no one needed to know these things. It didn't take long before we came into a fortress that was a structure made up of multiple stone walls surrounding a large pagoda tower at the center of the base. A fortress of the Fire Nation, it is used as a major material depot. Its walls are coated with iron to protect it from earthbenders. Oh, Observe showed a lot more than I thought it would. Usually, it had limited information in such large structures. But I guess it has been leveling up since I used it quite a lot. A young waterbending girl knows some waterbending, recently has had a growth spurt in her bending. She used to be level 7 at the beginning of our journey, but it seemed like she had grown quite a lot. Giving her that waterbending scroll wasn't so bad after all. Hopefully, she will be at least level 50 soon, that way she can be even more helpful in battle and truly stand by my side. So what's the plan? She asked me, knowing that I was the guy who usually handled battle strategies. There were a couple of hundred soldiers in there, and those Yuyan archers were dangerous even for me. I wouldn't fight such a battle, as the chances of me losing were pretty high. Depending on the commander, winning in a head-on battle could even be straight-up impossible. Using map, I checked who the highest-leveled person was. Usually, this would be useless, as it showed the strongest person and not the commander. But at least I needed to know who to take out first. Oh, now that shows who the commander is. This just became even more troublesome. Azula, if this was the end game, Azula, that was deranged, and without a strategic thought in mind, then that would be good. But this was the smart and ruthless Azula, the one who single-handedly took down Ba Sing Se without an army. She didn't even have the arrogance that could be used against her after she took Ba Sing Se. If Aang wasn't the Avatar, I would have let him in there a little longer. I was at a disadvantage in this battle, no matter how you looked at it. Well, this is the plan. I started instructing Katara, Sok. Not long after that, Sokka walked to the front gates of the fortress, still wearing his Earth Kingdom green outfit. Stop! Who is there? Of course, the Fire Nation soldiers stopped him at the gate, and Sokka smiled. Tam Kuzon, a spy of the Fire Nation, there is some urgent news that I need to send to the Fire Lord. Wait here, said one of the commanders. Unlike normal, Sokka had used the transformation jutsu to darken his eyes and hair, while making his face a little more older-looking, around 18 years old. He did this while away from Katara's view, because he knew that Azula was competent enough to recognize or at least suspect him from some posters that were already made of him. Soon enough, Azula herself came from atop the wall and looked down at Sokka. Kuzon? I never heard of a spy named like that. Can't explain everything, if you allow me to, princess. Sokka clasped his palm, to his fist, to show his respect. Her yellow eyes immediately narrowed on him in suspicion. I don't think I have ever met you before, yet you know me. What am I to make of that? My job is to deal with information, Princess Azula, Sokka added respectfully, trying to sound as much like a Fire Nation soldier as possible. Hmm. Azula kept staring at him, and then smiled slightly. Okay, open the gates, let... Kazan? What was your name again? Kuzan. Sokka could tell that she was testing him, and he didn't want to say anything that would invite suspicion. But as soon as the doors opened, he was greeted with a row of Yuyan archers pointing their bows at him, and firebenders in front of them, ready to burn him alive. Did she figure it out? wondered Sokka, getting ready to pull his spear out of the inventory as soon as possible. But he still acted his part for now and put his hands up. You can check me for weapons if you need to. Also, just to clarify, I am not a bender. Azula came in front of the troops, with her hands behind her back, as if daring him to attack her. How did you know I was a princess? Not even my father's spies would dare spread such information. Sokka bowed down on one knee. It was due to the way you walked, Princess Azula. The way I walked? Yes, you walked as if you owned this place. She smiled. You are quite competent. What was the information you wanted to give my father? This is better spoken privately, he muttered, glancing at the soldiers behind her. Azula chuckled, amusingly. Send him to the cells. Maybe that would be private enough for him. Also, try better next time. I have memorized the names of every spy outside of the Fire Nation. Sokka didn't resist as the soldiers came and to imprison him. Instead, 
He stared Azula in the eyes, and as the soldiers escorted him, he whispered to her, Come and meet me when you are ready. Sok, Katara POV I observed my brother from far away and saw that he was captured. Seeing someone you love being taken away as a prisoner would be hard on anyone, but I kept my mind clear and tried to think calmly, reciting Sokka's words. Thif 1am not captured, I will rescue Ang. If I am captured, then use the sewers to enter the fortress while everyone's attention is on me. Those were his exact words, but it didn't calm me as much as I wished they did. Because plans do fail, and in this case, failure might lead to his death. He had no weapon on him either, so he wouldn't be able to protect himself. If it came down to it, who would I save? Ang or Soka? Though this wasn't the exact situation, I couldn't help but think about it. Essentially, that was choosing between my brother and the rest of the world's safety. I didn't like the answer which came easily to me. It seems like I was more selfish than I thought. Joy Biana Oan, another chapter should come out today. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics, here it is the link. Here Discord. Gigahaftbeat slash BQRA. Chapter 49. Chapter 49. AN. Chapters in advance in Patreon. Patreon.com slash Holy Joker. 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 49. Sec. He was escorted to the prison by Azula. It was a little surprising that the Fire Nation kept their spies' catalogs. That was dangerous and it showed that they did not doubt that there were no spies within their ranks, because if there were, then it would destroy the whole spy network, because all they would need is their spies. Names and appearances. That was a very big weakness to have. Azula was smart, but a little naive and inexperienced to reveal something like this. Due to tricking an intelligently talented enemy, your intelligence increased by one. Tricking? I didn't trick her of anything, she simply made her assumptions about me. I will use that against her. Maybe getting within Fire Nation's ranks wouldn't be so bad. It just needed a bit of luck to not be discovered. Luck. The only thing that I had plenty of. Wait, what if Azula was lying about the whole document with the spies' names? Because that would be a stupid thing to have. Though I wouldn't put it past Ozai to have something like that, since he was quite deranged. In comparison to his predecessors and their strategic mindset, he hadn't achieved much during the years as Fire Lord. Now I just had to cook up a story for Azula, one without any holes in it. Hopefully, this works. Sok, Azula POV Kuzan was an unfamiliar name that I had gotten to know recently, and it was an old-timey name. More appropriate to being used a hundred years ago than in these times. There were many suspicious things about Kuzan, if that was even his real name but there was nothing that directly pointed to him being suspicious. Such a strange man, it was as if he had appeared out of nowhere. But such a thing was ludicrous, and it was only because I hadn't done enough of a background check on him. Eventually, the news will come of who he was, but for now, I should do my investigation and go ask him questions. Show me to the new prisoner's cell. I ordered one of the guards nearby, and they saluted me, showing that they were obedient. They are sheep, each and one of them was like lamb. Even the highest commanders wouldn't dare fight against me. Arriving at the young spy's cell, it was dark, unlighted, and made of metal. There was only a small opening in the door, but even then there was not enough space to put a finger through. Looking through the crack of the door, I was able to see Kuzan's body in the darkness, sitting on the ground. It was a little creepy how his dark eyes seemed to fuse with the darkness around him. Such unnatural looks. Are you ready to talk? That was the first question I asked him. He, on the other hand, chuckled. Talking from outside the door? Are you scared of me, an unarmed man, in a dark cell with guards all around, if anything were to happen? This bastard. I will burn him alive. Looking at the guards, I narrowed my eyes. Open the door. As the door opened, I walked in and blue flames gathered in my hand, lighting the room around us. The man looked at my fire and smiled. Your fire is beautiful. Flattery will get you nowhere. Though saying that was a little late, because everyone had told me that my fire was strong, dangerous, and intimidating. No one ever called it beautiful. Has no one ever told you? He inquired as if reading my mind. You should get out more. Fire isn't all about destruction. There is something strange about him. Should I just burn him to death? That would save me a lot of time and needless talks. 
he seemed intelligent enough to understand just how dangerous the situation was. So why is he playing around? Do you want to die? I asked him as the fire in my hand grew and became stronger. You shouldn't test my chances like this. Kuzan, on the other hand, didn't stop smiling and just leaned back on the wall as he was sitting down. Sorry, sorry, it's just that making yourself seem more human and pitiful would usually work against other people. What an emotionless bastard. He wasn't even a... afraid of death, knowing that he could die at any moment. There was no chance of him being able to do anything to me without a weapon on him and in such an enclosed room made of metal. Still, I could see that he was very skilled and even knew how to manipulate emotions. This was what most would call a born schemer. He would be useful. Sadly, I didn't trust him at all, and he too was untrustworthy. Now it was better to change the conversation, as fear tactics didn't work on him. What was it that you wanted to tell me? This place is very private. Princess, he said in a tired voice, looking at me as if I was stupid. You need to learn more about the world. Who would give you information after threatening them? You need to be their friend first. Torture would only make them say whatever you want. That would make them get out of the torture. Damn. He was right. This guy was undoubtedly a skilled spy. That made sense. Now I wanted him even more under me since his use went beyond what I expected. Someone like him wasn't something we could just train. Well, how about we get to know each other? I smiled and sat down in front of him, keeping the fire bright in my hand so he could see me and I could see him. Now that's more like it. Start talking about yourself and try to get me more comfortable. Remember to use half-truths as that puts the target more at ease. Okay, this guy just became ever more dangerous. We need him on our side, or else I will have to try and kill him. Soak, Soka POV. What a stupid girl. Trying to act smart, which she was, but that naive side that comes from a young age is still there. What I needed from her wasn't to convince her of anything, though the half-assed words that I heard on some YouTube video of a retired FBI agent. At least I think that's where I heard it, because the internet was a sea of information where I learned useless things. Though here, they were like a wealth of knowledge. The best public speakers, their speeches, all stood behind me. No matter how smart Azula was, she stood no chance. She will be interested in me, never expecting that was what I wanted, and Katara was the main force of the rescue, with Kiwi and one of my water clones keeping an eye on her. Yes, that's it. Now tell me some half-truths about your childhood. The closer to the truth, the better. I smiled at her reassuringly. Now it was time to try and get on Azula's good side. For being able to trick an intelligent person, intelligence increased by one. She was an intelligent stat grind. The best king, too, since she would keep me on my toes and learn fast. Normally a normal person might feel pressured that she would surpass them, but sadly for her, the higher her intelligence the better it was for me, as I would always be a step ahead due to my gamer interface. SRA AAA ACR AOR Okay, and if you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character pics, here it is the link. Discord.dade slash BQA Jirope. Chapter 50 Chapter 50 Truths AN Chapters in advance in Patreon Patreon.com slash HolyJoker 20 plus chapters in advance. Chapter 50 Truths Say Azula was a tricky opponent, and I had guided her into a battle of intelligence to increase my intelligence stat. But the last thing I wanted was to get overconfident and lose. That would be a horrible way to go out. She looked at the ground for a split second, seemingly contemplating what to say. My mother thought I was a monster. By her smirk. I could tell that she thought she could trick me like this. But I knew the truth behind it. This was the absolute truth. Azula's mother was abusive, though in a different way from Ozai. Telling your child she was a monster, what kind of parent does that? Well, some might say it in the head of the moment, but never mean it. At least most of the time. Azula looked at me strangely, as if waiting for me to say something. Right. She could never imagine that I would know something so personal about her in any logical way. Well, since she told me something about herself, I will match it with something of my own. Not about my life as Soka, but as someone else. I lied to the people I loved. Initially, I used to tell them everything, but then I started isolating myself, lying to hide my true self that was a failure in reality. 
until I realized that it was too late to say anything. Would she be able to tell whether I was lying or telling the truth? She was hurt by her truth, but I wasn't. Mine had been dulled by the passage of time. There was regret, no denying that, but it was useless to think about it now. Even if I had told them how much of a failure I was back then, it would have only worried them needlessly, and I would have regrets for telling them. Yeah, this was the kind of thing that had no right decision. Or maybe there was one, but I just couldn't see it. Azula muttered, confused. I am good at telling when people are lying, but I just can't seem to read you, the best liar that I ever saw. She didn't know what I told her was the truth, just like she did with me, so even if she saw past my deception, there wasn't anything I was hiding. You have outplayed a highly intelligent person. Your intelligence increases by one. Even the gamer interface seems to address her as smart. Was she as intelligent as I thought? Well, guess she was, though I consider Iroh to be smarter, or maybe he is just wiser. Azula had a strategic mind, with high intelligence, Iroh was smart too, but he was wiser than smart. How long until Katara saves Aang? Come on sis, do your job, your brother is spilling his heart here to the enemies. It's your turn now princess, we can't stop this little game of ours, let's see who goes further. She took that as a challenge and turned off her fire, the prison room immediately became dark. It was as if she was testing me whether I would attack her. That's a pretty good idea, but I wasn't here to attack her. No one in this world loves, she said emotionlessly. Oh, so she turned off the fire so I wouldn't be able to see her face. It seemed like I misunderstood her there. Well, we have already gone this far. There was no reason to stop here. Though I did wonder just how desperate she was to say these things to someone else, even under the guise of a lie. It's your turn now she said. There was no tone of taunting in her voice, just simple seriousness. Well, it would be useless to try and lie now. I never tried hard enough in my life, that's why I failed. These regrets will haunt me for the rest of my life. T taunted my brother when our mother died. Due to my greed, I wasn't able to see my loved ones even in their last moments. So, this went on for an hour, we were telling half-truths to each other. By now we both knew that we were telling the truth, but neither said anything. Princess Azula, the Avatar has escaped, one of the guards came. By the tone in his voice, he seemed scared that she would do something. But instead, she calmly got up and opened the door, turning around just before she walked. Out, we stared at each other's eyes. Wait here. Sure, I smiled. This girl was an intelligent stat grind. Just by talking for an hour I had gained an extra three intelligence points. It was all in the beginning too, since after a while she started realizing that we were both doing the same. So Katara and Aang were going back through the sewers, water bending their ways through it. How were you able to get to me? asked Aang, knowing that there were hundreds of guards around here. Sewers, air vents, steam pipes, answered Katara with a disgusted look on her face. I don't want to talk about it. Then where is Sokka? That sounds like something he would come up with. Katara was worried about that too. He had told her that she shouldn't worry and that he will be with them, waiting with Appa. But as she saw the light at the end of the sewers, Katara was ready to breathe out a sigh of relief. But then remembered where she was and decided to hold her breath for a little longer. Once they got out of the sewers, she was about to cheer, but stopped once she saw dozens of Fire Nations guard around them. Boom! They shot blasts of fire at them. But Aang came forward and used airbending to change the fire's directions, hitting the nasty water around them. Katara didn't stand idle either, so she used waterbending to manipulate that same nasty water and hit the soldiers in the face with it. Aga! It splashed in my face! It smells so bad! Some got in my mouth! Though she didn't do a lot of damage, the nastiness of the sewer waters was enough to make the soldiers fall in disgust. That's quite an effective method, a feminine voice rang out, making the soldiers forget their disgust and readily stand up. Katara saw that it was a young woman, with a dangerous look in her eyes. There seemed to be fire lit in her eyes. It seemed like there were hundreds of soldiers were there to accompany her. Avatar, how about you get back in your cage? Maybe then I won't hurt your girlfriend. Azula said maliciously, the murderous look in her eyes intensifying. 
but suddenly, a roar came from the sky, confusing the Fire Nation soldiers. That was when Appa landed down, and with a swish of his tail created a huge wind that pushed everyone else to the ground. While Sokka, who was riding Appa, smiled at Katara. Told you, I would be safe. Katara wanted to go and hug him, she was worried, and she could never get used to this. But decided against it, as they had to escape, she and Ang got in Appa and flew away, before anyone else but Azula, who shot blue flames at them, could do anything. She had used a blast of fire to counteract the pushing power of the wind, making such a split-second decision wasn't something most people could do. But even that, that didn't help her get the Avatar. As they were in the sky, Katara breathed a sigh of relief, asking her brother curiously, How were you able to get out of there? Have my ways, Sokka smiled. My ninja ways? She chuckled, for once not minding her brother's jokes. Sek Azula looked at the Avatar as he escaped. She knew that her father would be disappointed, but strangely, she didn't feel as disappointed as she would have normally felt. Instead, she calmly walked off while looking at her soldiers with disappointment. They all felt fear at her looks alone as she didn't need to say anything. As she got inside the fortress, a panicked soldier came towards her. Princess Azula, the prisoner, he. A Fire Nation soldier's helmet flew through the air. Fwish, bam, it hit the talking soldier on the back of the head, knocking him out. She saw Kuzan, his eyes looking at her hypnotically. He had a smile on his face. Were you able to catch the Avatar? To never told you we had the Avatar, Azula narrowed her eyes suspiciously, ready to attack him. The guards speak an awful lot. Better not have them know anything next time, Sokka said. He had sent the water clone to go and help Katara and Aang. Initially, he had planned to go with them and rejoin the group, but something no more interesting had crossed his path. You didn't leave? She questioned one last time, looking at his green clothes that were neatly suited, showing that he didn't have any difficulty taking out the guards. Also, if you killed any guards, I will have to hunt you down. No, don't worry, I didn't kill anyone, Sokka reassured her, and then added amusingly. I didn't have time to escape. That is a lie, Azula thought. She could tell by how casual he was about taking out the guards that he could have easily escaped while she was busy with the Avatar. If you want to join my Discord server to ask any questions or see character picks, here it is the link, hbest discord rx.